Can you introduce the stethoscope and its use in medical practice? Absolutely. So I'm here at the Thackeray Medical Museum in Leeds next to a case that's focused on diagnostics. And here we can see a selection of stethoscopes from throughout the ages all the way back to 1816 and Rivian Neck um, up to the binaural stethoscope that symbolises the medical profession today. Can you tell us how the stethoscope was developed? Yeah, yeah. So the stethoscope is one of those um, really interesting instruments that has a kind of um, moment of invention that, that's quite infamous. And René Lenec talks about this happening in 1816 in his 189 book, 1819 book on treaties of the diseases of the chest. And he talks about uh, rolling up a choir of paper from his notebook in order to listen to the heart sounds of one of his patients, um, who de he describes as having um, uh, as being a little bit plump, so he's not able to hear by pressing his head against her chest. And he says that he's, you know, surprised and pleased when he uses this rolled up note paper and presses it from his ear to her chest, that he can actually hear the sounds of her heart more distinctly than he could before. So in this way, really, the stethoscope, in principle, is just working like a hearing aid. Um, sounds are magnified through objects. Um, so really, the stethoscope is an extension of the ability to hear. It's a hearing aid for doctors to develop a way of listening to the patient that um, they are unable to do themselves. Does the stethoscope have any particularly interesting or surprising physical features? Well, I think if you look at this monaural example, you're going to be surprised that it's not binaural because, of course, this is the version that we all know and love, but this isn't invented until 1851. And then the, the version that we see here is probably the more like an 1855 version. Um, but, you know, originally Lynette calls it the cylinder. He, he wants it to be a cylinder and it goes from being a cylinder of paper to being a cylinder of wood. Um, and you can see from this one that it was probably quite heavily used. And um, really, really what's fascinating about this is, well, you know, I'm standing here in front of this diagnostic case and stethoscope, it comes from the Greek for chess and then scope for vision. And just like all of these tools, the ophthalmoscope, the vinoscope, um, they're all ways of being able to see the interior of the body. Um, just like my Fitbit, it's a medical visual aid that um, gives us privy to, to knowledge that we would never have had before, you know, just over 200 years ago. But of course, what's interesting about the stethoscope is that it's not, despite the scope, it's not really visual, it's auditory. Um, this is an auditory tool and it involves a particular way of attentive listening. So, I mean, many of the next treaties was over 700 pages long. And this is probably in part because we don't have a lot of words in the English language to describe sounds in the way that we do for, you know, visual things. We, you know, we can talk about things being bright or textured or fluffy or furry and all these kind of words that there isn't really oral equivalent. So I think Lenek drew a lot on metaphors. He talks a lot about, you know, like metallic tinkling and crepitus and being things being like a bellows. So it's a really long book, I think, partly because he's using so many metaphors. Um, and so it's kind of ironic that a tool that's associated so much with the clinical gaze is, is really something that is um, entirely oral and involves this kind of precise listening. Actually, the kind of um, technology is based on oscillation or, or you know, what Linux eventually called um, with a stethoscope, mediate os oscillation. Um, and he called it this because immediate oscillation would have been just directly pressing your ear to the patient. And this, you know, you can see even in as far back as um, Hippocrates. So we also have people like Aaron Ruger, who importantly worked out um, that oscillation could tell us about the amount of fluid in the chest, um, potentially by knocking on old wine barrels and, y y you know, using that technique of working out how much wine was in the barrel and then transposing it onto the patient. And, and this kind of um, then tapping to work out where the fluid is, is something that you'd still be very familiar with today if you have cystic fibrosis or if you care for someone with cystic fibrosis because you would use percussion and tapping um, at least every day to do this for yourself. And one of the things that's interesting again about this kind of um, attempt to make the oral visual is 
um, that I've looked at some doctor patient notes from the Bristol Royal Infirmary and you can see that the doctors um, you know, have taken things like pulse rate and respiration rate and so on and then they've, some of them have drawn little pictures, little cartoons almost of the patients with their lungs and just coloured in where on the body they can hear fluid and this provides then a record um, of the progression of the illness and also a record uh, for um, other doctors to, to look at and of course for us historians to come and marvel at years later. <laughs> That tension is really central to the stories we tell about the stethoscope because it is often framed as this tool that has allowed doctors to listen to the patient's body rather than listening to their stories and listening to the patients themselves and their narrative. And the stethoscope is inserted into this story about increased medical surveillance, this shift from bedside medicine to hospital medicine. Um, but of course nowadays the stethoscope is something that we, we welcome. It's very different, you know, uh, when people first started using stethoscopes, patients found it very aggressive, found it very invasive and intrusive, even painful. Um, but now a stethoscope is a sign that here is a doctor. <laughs> um, and it's also a way for the doctor to connect with the patient and to lay their hands on them. And it actually signifies connection and a way of listening that um, we, we often argue that we don't see as much of. So I, th I think it's shifted, interestingly, from um, a tool for social distancing into a, a tool that really signifies the closeness between the doctor and the patient. Does the stethoscope require practitioners to develop specific skills or competencies to use it effectively? That is another interesting thing about Linux's um, big volume is that he uses all of this abstract language to try and describe this kind of intense listening because it's really focused. You know what what he, what he was trying to do was create this kind of sonic lexicon to make these sounds of the body into data points, and he did this by connecting the sounds he was hearing with the diseases um, of his forty patients on autopsy and then try to, to codify that into to, you know, strict classifications. But it's very difficult to read a description of a sound and apply that in your own clinical practice. It takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of practice and skill that's often passed on. It's a little bit like a kind of a tacit knowledge, really. Um, uh, or I guess another way of describing it would be um, skilled listening. So the kind of listening that a musician would do. And, you know, of course, when, when you have the binaural stethoscope it means all of your um, hearing is concentrated on the interior sounds and the doctor can discern what these sounds mean in a way that the patient can't so this is really the first time that you have illness without experience of it and this the other reason that it becomes for a, you know a short time this kind of portent of of horror because it identifies disease and illness when the patient isn't aware of it and, and this is why it's um often, you know, a very kind of potent device in these narratives about increased um, sur surveillance medicine. But of course, it's, it's one of the most important diagnostic tools that we have and it leads into um, so, so many of the, the important inventions that we have now to, to understand our health and to connect it with our own experiences, you know, just like this. I think it's not fair to say that this is a good thing or it's a bad thing. I think it's very complicated and it's probably both things at once. <laughs> What does the stethoscope tell us about medicine and medical ethics? Well, as I've kind of tried to get at, I think the stethoscope is an icon. It's emblematic of medicine and it's emblematic of the relationships between doctors and patients. So it's very important to medicine. It's also very important to medical history. Um, and, you know, partly this is because when the stethoscope is first invented and used by people like Lynette, he's, you know, aspirational upper class and one of the reasons he doesn't want to be too close to his patients is because of the risk of disease. Although this is before germ theory, there's the risk of dirt and the sweat of the patient and he's dealing with primarily poor working class women. Um, so it's sort of a way to purposely socially distance from the patient. Um, and, and the rise of the stethoscope coincides with the rise of the medical profession itself. This is the you know, the period where it starts to become specialised and professionalised. And in fact, actually, this isn't just a coinciding. Part of the reason why medicine becomes more professional and becomes more specialised is because of the use of these professional tools and specialised techniques of listening.